Um, so I'm actually British, so I somehow feel compelled to start with an apology. Um, I am a medical librarian, um, so I'm not sorry that I'm a medical librarian, but uh, unfortunately maybe some of this won't resonate with, with all of you. Um, so what's different about a medical library? Well, we're attached to a medical center, so we have a clinical community to serve as well. Um, we're separate from the NYU campus, so if you're hoping for an update on what NYU is doing, um, I can't give you that. Um, to give you an idea of size, we have about 20 medical library faculty. So I always like to scare and inspire, and uh, this quote scares and inspires me. Um, don't assume that people care about libraries. People care about streamlining the processes that support research and learning, and I feel this is very real uh, for me. So um, when it comes to uh, streamlining, data is obviously a big part of this, um, and it's become a big puzzle that we all have to figure out. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was trying to think about what the theme of my presentation could be, um, and I happened to catch a show called Naked and Afraid, um, and I don't know how many of you have seen this, uh, or will confess to see. <laughs> um, so basically, they take two survivalists, um, and they drop them in the wilderness, um, and oh, by the way, they're naked, um, and they're given one tool to survive with, so I, I thought, you know what? That's exactly how I feel. Uh, this, is, this is me. So um, data management is a sort of strange, scary wilderness that I have to figure out, and I am totally naked and afraid. <clears throat> um, so if you've seen the show, part of the, uh, part of the show is to do a sort of pre-evaluation of uh, where you are at the beginning uh, versus the end. Um, so back in 2011, this is where we were. Uh, we had um, an e uh, informatics-oriented director in Neil Rambo, um, and we had uh, two librarians that had an interest in this, though weren't full-time on this. Um, there was uh, myself, uh, who uh, brings an experience of database and web programming, um, and also I was interested in uh, repositories uh, as a librarian. And then Elisa Elisa Circus is sitting right there. Um, <laughs> uh, she brought she's a translational science librarian, um, and she also brought her experience uh, from a PhD as a researcher. Um, so in terms of enthusiasm, we were really excited about this stuff. We, we both kind of had a love for data. Um, and so we were sort of dropped into this wilderness to try and figure things out. Um, and like all good survivalists, the first things we, we did was an environmental scan. Um, we took in our surroundings, tried to figure out what we could use. And actually, this was part of the 2011 ARL eScience Institute, um, which some, some of you may have done. Um, and what we found is that we were existing in a really complex environment as have, with having a school and a medical center attached, and that there were a lot of isolated services being started by uh, lots of people, but there was no real service point for these. And there was also a lot of gaps that seemed to represent opportunities for us. So we felt that education could be a good way to start since it didn't involve uh, resources other than time and knowledge. Um, and we thought we could start to build a resume on this stuff, um, maybe figure out what people needed, try to demonstrate our understanding and sort of test the water to see if there's a uh, space that we could occupy. <clears throat> Um, so uh, we thought it would be good to start with people who were newer researchers. Um, so Elisa had previously worked with the director of the postdoc program, and she reached out to him with a suggestion for a 90-minute class. And he said, thumbs up, that sounds like a good idea, and it would be useful to our postdocs. Um, obviously, we can't learn everything about data management in 90 minutes. Um, so we put a, these goals in place. Uh, basically, we want to set, plant some seeds of thought in the minds of the new, new researchers, um, raise their awareness of the data management issues, and then give some practical pointers that would immediately improve their workflows. <clears throat> um, so this is the outline of the class. Um, we did an introduction where we basically sort of introduced this idea that um, creating, processing, and analyzing is only half the story. Um, we had a section on incentives, which was carrots and sticks, things like um, policies, mandates uh, for data sharing versus um, incentives to, for citation and, and sharing that could improve science. Uh, there was the standards for description and documentation section, storage archiving and sharing, <clears throat> and at the end there was the data management planning. And we, we um, I think a lot of people as librarians came into this um, because of the NSF uh, data management plan uh, requirement, whereas in a medical environment, uh, most of our grants are actually NIH, and their policy doesn't have quite as many teeth, so <clears throat> this was sort of less pressing for this group. Um, so we tried to incorporate some t teaching methods that um, would make things a little bit brighter um, and maybe hit home a little more, including the scare tactics showing how uh, these mandates were gradually growing teeth and that it would affect their career. Um, and all bets are off as to when that question mark's coming off. We're kind of, are we, are we there yet? We don't know. <clears throat> 
We also brought in horror stories, such as tales of article retractions, um, like this one, and we felt that linking bad data management to loss of credibility would hit home for them. And we also worked through um, real-world examples, um, such as this one, and this is actually based on a presentation that was at this symposium a few years ago, Glenn Godet talked about his cardiology research, um, and this was my, how I imagined the sort of workflow to go, and I kind of liked how it showed how complex things could get if you didn't sort of have a good workflow in place and didn't have good uh, file management and naming conventions. Um, so to help them connect with the material, we, uh, we gave them a survey as they were coming in, and it had three data management questions on it, um, and then we'd uh, actually done a national survey of, of postdocs, and we were able to show how their answers matched to the uh, results of this national survey. <clears throat> and uh, we introduced chilling tales from our own lives. Um, and this is actually a picture of Elisa's research data from her PhD. Um, it's on a jazz drive, which lost to the zip drive, um, if you remember those. Um, and basically inaccessible. Uh, she unearthed it in her basement last year when she moved, and now it's living on a shelf in our office um, as a sort of cautionary tale to anybody uh, who looks at it. Um, <clears throat> we also uh, wanted to really bring some sort of humor in this. This is very dry material, so we created this three-part um, tale about bad data management. Um, and actually, ironically, the tool we used to produce this, Extra Normal, went offline with absolutely no warning last year. Uh, we had, you know, we, we, fortunately, we backed it up, which is good, good for us. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's not there anymore. It's kind of sad. <clears throat> so in the end, um, we'd, we'd made it for postdocs, but we just decided, let's just advertise it to the whole institution and see what happens. Um, and we actually ended up with a really diverse population um, attending this, including basic scientists and clinical as well as population health researchers. And um, we got positive feedback across the board with almost everybody saying they would probably or definitely use the material, and over 75% being interested in more education on this. <clears throat> so we felt like we'd, we'd built something solid, we'd build a raft, something we could maybe use to, to sail down this river. <clears throat> but um, we needed to keep honing our skills. We'd done a lot of research for the class, so we felt like we'd learned the policies and things that were happening outside of our institution. Um, but we didn't feel like we had a solid grasp of what it was like to be a researcher within our institution and what kind of data support was available. Um, so still, to some degree, living in my little tank, I kind of needed to get out there and experience this. Um, so around this time, um, the library had birthed the Division of Knowledge Informatics and added its first member, Theodora Barker. And uh, she came to us from the Medical Center's Electronic Health Record Implementation Team. Um, so she had an understanding of the sort of business and clinical end of things. And also she brought some data modeling experience. So we saw this as a bridge to potential new opportunities and also a cool name for our data management services. <clears throat> um, and so uh, NLM had announced this um, opportunity uh, for an administrative supplement um, to an existing NIH grant for an informationist to take part in the grant. Um, so we applied for two of them. We got them both, and I worked on one of them. I'm going to talk about that for a while. Um, so um, our grant was this one, Clinical Management of Cochlear Implant Patients with Contralateral Hearing Aids, uh, with Mario Sversky and Arlene Newman. Um, and just so you understand what that is, it's uh, it, people with studying people with a hearing aid in one ear and a cochlear implant in the other. <clears throat> And our, our aims were um, to evaluate and restructure the data model, database, and data entry tool for data collection, to refine, refine existing reporting queries to address new data, to develop a tool that, uh, to allow non-experts to be able to pull the reports they need. Um, and on this was um, Theodore, who brought her data modeling experience, and myself with my data programming and application design. So uh, in order to create something that reflected the research accurately, we needed a at least a basic understanding of the, the technical details uh, of the tests and devices that were involved, and this is one of them, a cochlear implant. <clears throat> so we spent a bit of time understanding this. Um, and then we spent a lot of time just trying to understand their workflow. Um, so uh, around 2003, they'd paid someone to build an application um, in Microsoft Access, um, and it had basically stayed in Microsoft Access 2003 um, and hadn't been able to move forward as Access had. Um, so it was kind of stuck there, and it was, it was difficult to sort of get someone to develop on it. Um, so they just started to sort of add spreadsheets for extra data points. Um, and then uh, within the last few years, because the cases that they're studying are so rare, 
um, they started to work with international researchers, um, and they basically submit their data via email in a, a de-identified in a spreadsheet. So it started to become difficult for the PIs to analyze all of this data because it was all sort of in different places. <clears throat> so um, our solution was to uh, envision this new database that would um, combine all of those data sets um, and make it easy to import uh, the consortium data. So around this time, uh, nature threw us a curveball. Um, our base camp was completely submerged in water. Um, this is our library uh, before it got hit by Hurricane Sandy. Um, and what you can't see uh, off the side here is our server room. <laughs> um, so uh, this was taken, I think, about six to eight months ago. Um, it's being used for old hospital beds. Um, uh, my office was on the floor below this one. Uh, got, was filled up like a bathtub. Um, we lost pretty much all of our books. Um, and all of our, we weren't able to go back into our office space since. So, um, so that was definitely one on the chin. Um, but in terms of, of knowledge, we'd produce this class. We'd, we'd gain some, gain some uh, knowledge and experience in that. Um, in terms of resources, although we'd gained a division and a new person, um, unfortunately, we were trying to sort of rebuild this infrastructure that we'd lost. Um, and so really, the resources stayed the same. And then stamina, uh, this definitely took a toll on us. It was kind of, uh, kind of exhausting, and um, we couldn't sort of pay attention to data management services the way we, we wanted to. <clears throat> and really, we never felt so naked and afraid. Um, all of a sudden, we didn't have a physical identity, um, and we needed to really be demonstrating what we could do through our services. <clears throat> um, so um, in, the, in, the, in the winter of, of our uh, discontent, um, we, we put this uh, on YouTube. It was just sort of random thing, just timing happened to go up there. And um, within a few days, it was picked up by Creative Commons, and they tweeted it, and uh, it was retweeted, and all of a sudden, we had 3,000 hits, and we were kind of like, <laughs> sort of stunned by this. Um, but it was just sort of came at the right time. We needed that morale, morale boost around this stuff, and uh, like, okay, so maybe, maybe this is good. Maybe we can go back and take a look at this class we did and see what we can do with it. So we, saw, we started to figure out how we could set sail down the river. Um, and around this time, we were joined by uh, Kevin Reed as the NLM fellow, um, and he uh, quickly became liaison to emergency medicine in the basic sciences department. Um, and he brought a, a background knowledge of um, having worked on the catalog part of the big, uh, NIH's Big Data to Knowledge Initiative. And we're like, okay, we're ready, we're set. Let's start to move this thing down the river. Um, but as we started to set off, we noticed that there was a fork in the river around the different education needs. Um, and it seemed to look like an apples to oranges situation between basic and clinical. So on the one hand, we had um, our basic scientists. Um, their data varies very widely. Um, so when we're teaching it, we have to keep things general uh, because if we, if we start to go into any detail, then we have to specialize as no way out of that. Um, their data practices are much less consistent than clinical. Um, basically from IT, they get given storage space and little else. And uh, it's basically like the Wild West out there. Um, so uh, also the problem of the postdoc sort of uh, turnover and leaving sometimes without documentation. Um, this was much more of a reality for these people. Um, and then there were the oranges, the clinical investigators. Um, their data is much more consistent. And because of this, IT is able to offer a couple of systems that support this. Um, at our institution, we have uh, something called Red, REDCap and Realus, which are both web-based um, data management systems. Um, and also these people have a greater recognition of the value in sharing. Um, and if you think of the idea of a meta-analysis, it kind of makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> so our strategy for the basic scientists um, was to continue to teach the class to the postdocs. Um, we also wanted to keep improving our material. Um, and to do this, uh, we tried to get out of our tank as much as possible and force non-librarians to watch this, even if it made their eyes and ears bleed. Um, we wanted them to, you know, Value, help evaluate this for us, and uh, our first uh, iteration of this uh, had a double goal slide and quite a bit about metadata, um, and eventually we, we slashed that and we tried to make the metadata section much more tangible, <clears throat> and also focus it, focus it on documentation. <clears throat> uh, we also continue to use our evaluation forms, and we keep updating those policies so that when we teach this, it feels, continues to feel urgent and relevant. Um, so the basic scientists, uh, the third part of this was to uh, keep um, looking for new opportunities through our liaisons, and we have a few liaisons in uh, basic scientists, uh, sciences. 
And so why the beer glass, you might be wondering. Um, so Kevin recently presented this to the PIs in his basic science liaison group. And they were actually really, they hadn't heard that we could teach this and they were excited about this. Um, so we've secured a 30 minute time slot um, to teach all of the students and postdocs in this one, one institute. Um, but it's pre their happy hour. So a um, <laughs> little concerned about how it's gonna go with us being between them and their beer. Um, but I'm keeping my fingers crossed, so. And for the clinical, so um, as I said, we opened up the class to a, a really broad audience and we got good feedback from everyone. So we thought, let's see how we can use this in clinical. Um, so we approached someone called uh, Jim Robertson, who's a clinical data expert at our institution, and he has over 30 years of experience of this stuff. And we, showed, we were able to show him what we had, and um, it was very clear that we, our approaches were very complementary. So while we were interested in sort of big picture policies, data sharing, and preservation, um, he was really focused on the sort of day-to-day -day data integrity issues. <clears throat> um, so we decided to try to create a series of short modules for these busy clinicians um, who don't have a lot of time to, to do huge education programs. So um, we worked with Jim to come up with initial, an initial list, and uh, this was it. We, we anticipate that these will be five to ten minutes each, and they will be online. Uh, the blue ones probably look more familiar. These are things we felt we could handle. Um, and the red ones were thing, things we wanted uh, Jim to help us with the content for. Um, and so uh, in the midst of this, it was unclear what our outlet was going to be. So we kind of wanted to create some kind of uh, calling card or an example of what we could do. So we started with a module zero. And this was called How to Avoid a Data Management Nightmare, the teaser. <clears throat> so... Um, in the meantime, an opportunity arose for Elisa to join a new working group um, to develop an education program for clinical investigators. And um, we thought maybe this would be a good outlet for the modules. Um, and this group definitely recognized that data management should be part of this, uh, this education program. Um, so we submitted a short list of modules. Um, and we were able, by this point, we'd finished our module zero and were able to show them, show them what we had. And uh, I will hopefully be able to show you what we gave them. Um, so, we, we, as you can see, we felt that we took a bit of a risk on the, sort of the approach, um, but when we shared it with a few people in this, this group, all of them immediately said they loved it and, and we've had really good feedback. Um, so, um, we we're ready to move forward on that one. <clears throat> so, um, going back to my informationist project, um, our researchers had been um, unable to access their lab for four months because of the, the hurricane. And when they finally got back in their lab, they, they invited us back to restart the project. And if you recall, this was the aim, this new database. And um, we sort of went into this being aware that there was these clinical data management systems, not really having a lot of experience with them, but thinking that these could be um, useful for this. So we started there. We um, evaluated these. Um, but because he was starting with quite a complex data model, it very quickly became apparent that we couldn't use either of these. Um, so we were forced to go back to thinking about Microsoft Access. Um, so looking at that, it was going to take quite a bit of work to bring it up to the current Access. Um, there was going to be development time involved in adding the new features they wanted. And then we were going to basically walk away and give them what they'd started with. And we 
didn't feel entirely comfortable with that. Um, so we were starting to feel like, are we ever going to be able to start this thing? How, what are we going to do? Um, are we going to sort of walk away and, and, and this is, leave them with what, what they had? Which is, this is the original tool. Um, so we started to look at a custom development. Um, and this was, uh, again, going to be a lot of development time, but it was starting to seem like the only way we could fulfill our aims. So we're like, are we really doing this? Um, yes, I think we're in for the long haul. Let's do this. Um, so Theodora mocked up her uh, unified model. Um, and this is that. And I started to put together an application for them. Um, and by this point, I had been playing with several electronic data capture tools, and I started to learn what some of the expectations of these things were. Um, and one was, for example, the validation uh, status, so the idea that one person en enters the data and another one can go in and just check that it makes sense and that it's reasonable. Um, things like validation on ranges of values and autocomplete, and also an audit trail, which is really important in clinical, uh, clinical data management systems. And uh, we could basically do whatever custom reporting we wanting, wanted, they wanted because we were starting from nothing. So, um, so in terms of takeaways of this project, um, so uh, we got a, although it sort of grew substantially from what we planned it to be, I feel like we really got a lot of experience out of it that was useful. Um, we were able to get experience with the tools that were out there. Uh, we learned a lot about the research and workflows um, in this kind of situation. Uh, we also made some contacts with our research IT department and asked them a lot of questions and uh, opened some doors there. And um, I think for the future, this was sort of a valuable experience to um, put ourselves in the shoes of a researcher for a while. Um, but I think in the future, these have to be sort of selected quite carefully um, so that we know how much they're going to uh, grow or scale. <clears throat> um, so this has been a tale of two projects. Um, our library is doing a lot of other things, uh, but these are the two that are closest to me. Um, so, uh, staying true to my theme, uh, this is a post-evaluation of our skills uh, through these projects. We feel like we learned a lot, um, and by the way, this is based uh, on entirely objective, uh, real solid data, uh, these charts. Um, so, in terms of resources, we gained a division and we've uh, gained about, I think, four more people uh, dedicated to data management. Um, in terms of stamina, we feel encouraged by the positive um, outcomes of some of these things, so we're good moving forward. <clears throat> um, so what about the challenges? Um, so uh, I think it's, uh, it's quite apparent that data, data landscape keeps shifting. Sometimes you start to develop with something and then someone else does the same thing and they have more money or, you know, so you're sort of, you, you have to keep sort of doing, a, uh, navigating this shifting landscape, um, but I think it's important to try. Um, also, um, a lot of people think they own pieces of this, um, and we're also fighting the sort of perception of uh, what the library should be doing. Um, and, and of course, our, our knowledge is still very much developing in this, and because of all these things, we're often outside of our comfort zone. <clears throat> um, certainly a big one for us, as it turned out, was uh, there's a lot of time, effort, and persistence in uh, creating these things, and just uh, to get your foot in the door and, and be recognized as having a role in this. And uh, we really had started off not knowing where to start, but I think we just kind of kept picking pieces of it, and gradually it's sort of becoming, starting to form a picture. Um, and I think we're just going to keep going like this. <clears throat> so to do all this, we uh, took advantage of the library strengths uh, that already existed. We had uh, knowledge of scholarly communication issues, uh, repositories and data sharing, uh, knowledge of education. We had a lot of liaisons. Um, knowledge of the metadata and also you know, our skill at finding answers to things. Um, I also took advantage of individual strengths. Um, and I find that everyone I talk to who's a librarian has a really interesting background. And I think this is where you can sort of put these to, to good use. Um, and, and every kind of person has been necessary on these things. We have people that have big ideas and we have detail-oriented people who want to get into the uh, nitty-gritty and then you know we have people who are happy just going out and talking to people about this stuff um, and we, we took a lot of measured risks and uh, we just tried to just keep putting ourselves out there um, and, and approach things creatively so we would stand out um, and the big one for us I think has been to forge these partnerships um, I think uh, every time we talk to someone their data names their data needs are enormous um, so it's, it's sometimes hard to sort of pass that out into what's, what can be a service. 
Um, and we, we, we feel we've been strengthened through these partnerships. And then some, it's sometimes it's a, well, it's definitely a relief to uh, know that you don't need to know everything about this stuff and just sort of partner with someone knowledgeable, but try to bring something tangible to the table that they can see what your contribution will be and just being sort of honest about that. <clears throat> so we have uh, partnerships with uh, CTSI and with Research IT here. <clears throat> um, so through all of this, uh, We've, uh, we've gone through some pockets of success, um, and that's been encouraging. We've had a bunch of failures too, um, but uh, we just we keep moving forward, and I don't want to leave you with this slide. I want to leave you with this slide. Um, our story is far from over. Um, we're going to keep uh, getting through that jungle, um, and the story is to be continued. Uh, I want to acknowledge my fine colleagues, um, as well as the researchers on the Informationist Grant and our grant supplement funders. Uh, references, images, and thank you.